me just to introduce my panelists for the next 50 minutes. Again, to my immediate right, I have Honorable Clever Gatete, who's Minister of Finance and Economic Planning, Rwanda. Dr. Belai Begashaw, Director General of the SDGCA. Mr. Sindiso Nguenya, Secretary General, Comesa. And Mr. Admasu Tadese, President and Chief Executive Officer of the Trade and Development Bank of Eastern and Southern Africa. I just want to go back to the context of the Sustainable Development Goals and in a nutshell what we're aiming to do is end poverty. We're looking to protect the environment and to promote prosperity for all by 2030. So we're going to use that as the underpin for our discussion for the next 50 minutes. I also want to put some stats on the table. 2012, the World Bank came out with a stat that 43% of all Africans live below the poverty line. 621 million Africans do not have access to electricity as of today. And millions of Africans die from preventable diseases. Now that's despite the Millennial Development Goals having been in place to 2015 from, from 2000. And a lot of progress has been made. But part of the report, Africa 2030, highlights the targets, the gaps, what hindered the ability to meet those targets, and also highlights the successes and what can be replicated as we move into executing the SDGs. We can't, in 50 minutes, go through the report in depth. And we've just had the high-level summary. I love that one-liner, that business as usual, is that that path will not be enough to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. But let's get three starting points. And one is that we need to understand that financing is a key issue for us to achieve health, education, to fund the infrastructure deficits that we see widely across the continent from an energy and from a transport and logistics perspective. What do we need as a starting point to attract that financing? And here I'm going to throw it to Minister Gatete. The topic that has just come out of the World Economic Forum around Africa is that policy consistency is absolutely crucial to attract funding. And if we're talking about sustainable development goals, which are long-term in nature, nothing shorter than 15 years, we've got to look through the short-termism of politics, which traditionally looks to a three to five year political cycle. So we want policy stability. I know, Mr. Gatete, Minister Gatete, that this is speaking to your book. Yeah, thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, you just said it all. Um, uh, definitely for us, I, I think the most important thing is to have the leadership that is guiding the whole development process. And that leadership is what brings actually policy certainty because the investment is not going to be done by government only. There is a limit to how much government can do. It has to be done in partnership with all international financial institutions, with the private sector, with all the different stakeholders and partners. And the implementation process has to be done by ordinary people, meaning that actually they must get involved they must believe in it, meaning that, as my president said in Davos, the mindset has to change. And you believe in it. And you have a clear plan. And the policy is supporting that. And you know that you are all looking in the same direction. That way then, the rest is how you implement, how you innovate, how the people become part and parcel of that process. And that way then, you can achieve so much in a very short time. Just to give one example, you mentioned investment in education. I don't think after genocide, when Rwanda was, the economy declined by 50%, inflation at 63%, and poverty levels at 78%, I don't think it was a very rich country. But by achieving universal primary, nine-year basic education, 12-year basic education, up to now, achieving universal health services, it's not because Rwanda had too much money. It's because of the vision. It's because of the strategy. It's because of the leadership that is making the whole system work. So this is very, very important. And this one, designing the policies, as you rightly mentioned, 
the certainty is very, very important. The investors have to be reassured that once I invest my money, things are not going to change overnight, meaning that actually they can count on the stability looking long-term horizon. So what he said is very, very true. Dr. Begashaw, let me bring you in here. This center came into being in September 2015. Working with the Rwandan government, the host agreement, the host country agreement was signed in February 2016, and you were up and running by July 2016. Now, that's the speed of execution that we are looking for in projects of this nature. So perhaps starting there, and the fact that the center is going to be doing a lot of work on policy, on advising, not only on a national basis, but also on a regional basis. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, you're right. Uh, let me again uh, lend the statement that we started the <clears throat> uh, report discussion. Business as usual is not going to work. We have to do things differently. We have to do things differently at all levels. And whether it's institutionally or how we can plan things, and whether um, you know the speed of the implementation that we said that it was satisfactory in the past, um, all these things have to be um, actually uh, <clears throat> reset again in order to see how we can actually bound with the time interest that this very important call set for us. I think one of the most important things that SDG has brought to us um, is we are actually trying to plan from future to present. In the past, our experience is planning from present to the future. But now we set our goals. We set where we want to take our country, our continent, our people, and in fact, the globe um, in the coming 15 years. So we got to see how we can set also our speed, our business model, including the financing that you have said earlier, uh, to fit in into this, because we are actually planning in a cascaded way, so that we can actually see how in each year, right from this time onwards, that those things that we are planning to achieve in the coming 15 years are piling and contributing in, in, uh, every year. So the center like this is the center that's trying to support countries effort towards achieving this thing. The first and most important thing that the center is trying to do right now is actually to contextualize what these SDG goals and indicators are. We need to contextualize us. We need actually to help people understand it because if, unless we contextualize it, you will not be able actually to change mindsets because people will understand things from their own perspective and people will understand how these things will contribute to their livelihood, and that is a way to sell these ideas rather than to put the big indicators like 17 goals and this kind of stuff. But contextualizing and contents are two things that we should have to have hand in hand. While we are contextualizing this, we should not also, also omit the universal language that we said that will help us to understand where we are standing in the midst of the entire effort in the globe, particularly in the global agenda that we also have to contribute responsibly. So this kind of center would help, actually, expedite this process, help also you know, um, do these things in a different way. And uh, because we have to preach and advocate about this, we also have to play an exemplary role that you mentioned, you know, this center is only there open here five and a half months ago, now trying to see how we can actually get to some extent catching uh, to the lost time. Thank you. And uh, just on that point, in the Africa 2030 report is a fantastic chapter on backcasting, which Dr. Begashaw was referring to there, is deciding where you want to be and then looking back and deciding the steps that need to be taken to, to get to that situation. Cindy, so I'm going to bring you in here, and if you can weigh in with your experience at Comesa in giving us a sense of the challenges you see to regional integration, which is going to be crucial to unlocking sustainable development goals for the African continent. 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, well, um, I saw the conclusion of the report presented that it should be business unusual, which therefore means that uh, if you look at regional integration, the way it has been designed, the way it is delivered, we also need to have a paradigm shift in that model. So what do it require? Uh, it will require uh, that we have, uh, as was stated in the statements this morning, that you have the governments on one hand, you have the academia, you have the private sector, you have uh, also the civil society. So, so all these, you know, different categories have got to be, you know, integrated uh, because um, if you look at where we are and where we are coming from, there is a perception out there that regional integration is elitist. Elitist in the sense that uh, uh, it does not involve all these stakeholders, particularly um, in, in Africa where you find that the academia, the governments and the private sector and the other stakeholders they are not working together. So that's what has got to be done. Because without doing that, then it will be difficult to mainstream the SDG goals into regional integration. Because in any case, regional integration is the sum total of what is being done at the country level in terms of the priorities, the strategies, and the national you know, plans. So. Uh, for us, uh, uh, I can say that uh, uh, the following is the focus. One, uh, that uh, uh, we uh, look at regional integration in terms of knowledge management. Because if you do not, uh, not uh, do manage knowledge, what it means is that you'll end up you know, repeating what others have done. Um, and therefore, if you have knowledge management, then you move away from what I can describe as uh, extract, extractive, extractive economies to learning economies. Uh, because uh, there's something very interesting that extractive economies are also underpinned by an extractive mindset in terms of thinking. Because you are not creative, you are not innovative. So therefore, knowledge management, gives rise to learning economies, learning economies to innovation. Those are, are critical. But most importantly also, that uh, we build on the best practices uh, within you know, the, 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 the region. And there's quite a lot uh, that is uh, happening. We don't have to reinvent you know, the wheel. That's all I can say. Thank you. So we touch on the policy certainty aspect, and then we move to the dearth of financing, because this is going to be a challenge that we keep coming back to over and over again. And Admasio, I think it's appropriate that I just put some stats on the table before I uh, throw to you and show you how big the hole is. So if you look at su Sustainable Development Goal 3, which relates to health, there was an Abuja target of 2015, which very few countries actually met, and that was to spend 15% of government expenditure or GDP on health. Rwanda was one of the countries that achieved that from uh, the Abuja target. If you go to SDG 4, which is around education, and the fact that there's around about a $40 billion annual deficit in the funding of primary and secondary education across the African continent, you see the whole. If you go to SDG 7, which is around energy and infrastructure, and you understand that the annual deficit there is somewhere between 50 billion and 100 billion dollars on an annual basis, you know why we need the bankers in the room. So it's financing. And it's a lot of financing that's going to be needed to get us to achieving the SDGs. At Masu, on that contextual note, let me throw to you. Uh, thank you very much. I, I, I think really the, the key point around business unusual has been made. 
I think that's the obvious point. I think the, the hard reality is if we think back to the turn of the millennium in 2000, during the MDGs, there was this estimate of about $64 billion per annum required to achieve a much narrower set of goals. Today, we're looking at SDGs being a much wider set of goals and even a much more ambitious set of goals. It's not meeting certain targets. It's about ending hunger, ending poverty, ending inequality. It's a huge, it's a huge order. And so in, 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 in a nutshell, really, what, what it means is, first of all, is the net. The public sector finance net has to be extended. We actually know tax administration is one issue. Public sector efficiency is another issue. The whole question of windfalls in the resources sector has to be dealt with. These are the key issues in the, in the public sector. But I think what's going to be so key, as many people have said, is to get the public sector to leverage and harness institutional capital and private capital. And, and I think the policy aspect that you referred to earlier on about continuity, stability is one thing. But performance is critical. It's one thing to have the right policies, but if they're not implemented, if the institutions that govern those policies don't deliver, nothing will happen. Because we all know that institutional capital, private capital, flows not just to safety, but to performance. And I think the biggest challenge you're going to have is to actually convince those decision makers that there is performance in addition to stability. People want to be able to invest their money, they want to make a return, and they want to get their money out of the country that they invest in if they're going for geographies. And uh, from Davos again, Minister Gatete, we did conclude on many of the discussions that there is lots of money looking for deployment, but you need bankable projects. And it comes back to the skills, the feasibility, and taking the projects out there from the planning or from the initial stages through to the bankability, the de-risking that was touched on earlier by Admasu in terms of the project finance solutions that need to be arranged, Take me forward on the discussion point here, bringing the project to bankability, because we're concluding the money's there, but we're also competing not only with every single country on the African continent, but every other global market looking to further their economic growth scenarios. So it is a challenging and competitive environment for money. In our case here in Rwanda, we don't just simply plan. We start from the vision, we start from the five-year strategy that we have, and then we plan backward because we already in the vision identified the pillars that are going to help us in terms of reaching our vision. And once you do that, then you plan in line with the strategy that is going to help us get there. For the government financing, we do the public investment uh, analysis that we normally say this can be financed by the government. And then at the same time, government alone investment is not going to be sufficient. And that's why the private sector financing becomes very important. But you cannot do a plan, you cannot do a project by government alone and say private sector, here it is, finance it. They must have input from the private sector for it to be bankable in the way that they see it. And there has to be that kind of partnership. That's why the PPP is very important, and that's why you have the law in Rwanda that guides the PPP. In that case, then you want to make sure that you work in partnership and say, private sector, here is, there is an opportunity. The project is viable, we've done it together. We need this one to be financed. What do you need from the government? How can we partner? Either it is incentive, or it's partnership in terms of joint venture. And this can be done not only in the country, but it can also be done at the regional level. Because some of the big projects, especially which require big financing, are regional in nature. In this case, in this way then, you know the partnership. Not you doing it and then thinking that somehow the other financiers are going to come in and be able to finance it. But at the same time, what is also very important is the, also the civil society, the ordinary people to believe, understand this is very important for them, so that they have also the buy-in. And that becomes very, very important. That's what we are saying this morning, results is very important. In the present speech, he mentioned this. Once the ordinary people see there is a gain, then they put pressure. And that way it forces you, as government, to make sure that you can coordinate in terms of financing those kind of programs. 
But what I'm insisting here, there has to be public-private partnership at the national level, but also at the international level. Because money has no boundaries. It has no nationality of any kind. It's just an opportunity. And it all goes back to whether I believe the stability going forward is conducive. I believe, I, uh, and also for someone to believe that the macroeconomic stability is there, the business conducive environment is there, the political stability is there, the governance, the security, and all other things, including low corruption or no corruption. Those are the conditions that also guide someone to say, I can engage. But also, even if you have all those things and the projects are not designed properly, someone is risking their money and they want a good return. They want certainty. They want to make sure that nothing is going to happen. But if they know there is rule of law, there is, law corruption, there is no corruption, the governance is, is okay, the economic stability is there, they can see it in the long term, there is no reason why the money cannot come in any form, but the money is there, and it's quite a lot. And that's why the environment is clear that is needed to make sure that it produces the environment for anybody to come in and uh, also participate. The other element I want to bring in, and we're going to weave it back in from the opening statement, was obviously on climate change, which is something that we need to take into consideration, protect the environment, part of the SDG, uh, in terms of the 17 SDGs in particular. And we also need to look at that population growth. The stat on the table again, 2100, we're looking at 3.8 billion people on the African continent. And we need to cater for those people from a jobs perspective, from an inclusive growth perspective. But Dr. Begashaw, let's start with the climate change. And again, the stat, I'll take you back, is that if we see climate change, a two degree Celsius change in climate change, we will see 40 to 80% of the crop lands that are there to grow the millet, the wheat, and the maize, 40 to 80% of that cropland could disappear by 2030, 2040. That's the stat on the table. So we need to move, plan with speed of execution, and we need to protect the environment. Is that a conversation that Africa is ready to have? Thank you. <coughs> um, if you don't mind, before I go to that, can I comment on the previous one? Um, I think because it's a most pertinent question that you raised. Um, there have been so many cases now, governments, particularly governments who believe that about development and state investment kind of um, economy policy, um, are uh, daring and coming uh, forward actually to make investment that will help facilitate private sector, you know, to come and actually uh, put investments on major issues like energy infrastructure and other things. But still the government support is mainly by, you know, on, you know, conventional infrastructure stuff. But the issue now is we have a lot of innovative ideas. And these innovative ideas have to be escorted and ushered through any means before it becomes a bankable project. So I think I really want to comment and recommend to governments uh, actually <clears throat> to see how they can really uh, borrow the venture capital idea from the private sector and start investing a little bit on this so that you know, we can help nurture these businesses until it gets to the bankable level so that the banks can support because it will be feasible for you know, investment. The second important thing is the government needs to play a sort of a guarantee role, which otherwise no one would be there actually to invest a lot of money on innovation that have never been widely popularized and adopted um, in, uh, in the program. So that, that partial guarantee status? It could be 5%, it could be 7%. I guarantee you will not really push the energy thing, the renewable energy um, you know, ideas and uh, very innovative practices that we start developing without having that kind of guarantees. The guarantees may be in terms of um, loan, the guarantees also may be in terms of giving them some kind of space for, you know, five years or seven years until at least partial part, you know, part of their investment is being recovered and um, in order to them to be able to come and invest uh, substantially 
um, on such kind of innovative ideas. So I see Sandisa is agreeing with you, Mr. Gatete. Yes. So are you, sir, if you could yeah. take it from here? Just, um, uh, he's making a very important point, of course. Uh, uh, let me just give you an example, to just to elaborate what he's saying. In the case, for, for example, in energy, Rwanda used to finance all the energy from development up to the uh, final access and in the infrastructure that goes with it. But it reached a point whereby it is too expensive for Rwanda to afford that kind of energy generation. And since the energy in Rwanda is bought by one agency, which is a utility agency that is 100% owned, we decided that actually the generation can be done by the private sector because the government wants to have negotiated the power purchase agreement and it is guaranteed by the government. Then the generators, the private sector, can now be able to develop the energy with the confidence and with the guarantees that they are going to sell to one owner institution, which is guaranteed by the government. And that's why now we have uh, uh, Contour Global uh, generating methane gas, 26 megawatts. It's going to go beyond 100 megawatts. That's why I've got Symbion that's going to generate over 70 megawatts. That's what we've got uh, Hakan for pit to power in terms of generation of uh, pit energy, uh, 80 megawatts. And this way then, the government would concentrate on building the infrastructure so that there's less leakage and also the access and distribution. That way there is a division of labor because of that element of guarantee that he's talking about. So let's take this discussion on partial guarantees okay. further, but we're also touching on the climate change aspect yes. here because the continent is awash with natural resources for these renewable projects, and of course the cost of the renewable projects now has come down significantly, specifically in the solar space. So it's no longer we can't afford to power the continent through renewables because it's too expensive. It's that we need to be innovative in the partnerships that we create. Dr. Bateshaw, you wanted to add before yeah. we go to Cindy Sow? Um, do you want me to comment on the climate change thing? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Take yeah, excellent. Discussion. All right. Um, I think we, I mean, when, when we talk about Africa and climate change, um, I really want to focus on three things. Um, the first one is the variability of Africa. And the second one is uh, the vulnerability of Africa. And the third one is the uh, adoption uh, capacity of Africa. Um, I think these three important points are really benchmark um, uh, to establish that the two most outstanding issues that will really compromise whatever gains that we can do right now um, around SDGs or any other feasible program will be population growth and climate change. So why uh, variability? Um, Africa is a big nation and uh, three major uh, actually ecosystems, as you know. There are uh, parts of Africa under temperate, um, parts of Africa is under tropical, and uh, the, there's desertification. And the pace of actually losing you know, uh, the whole arable land is also just one extremely important alarming point that we are into. So this variability, um, and taking into accountability these variabilities is, is taking into account accountability of uh, combating the situation, focusing our research, and also uh, focusing our investments. The vulnerability one is actually more alarming because, as you mentioned earlier, a lot of crops already reached to their tolerance thermal level. Wheat is going to be, if you take wheat now and soya beans, these are crops maybe in a few years' time that their growing period will be shortened. And if their growing period will be shortened, that means their productivity will be shortened because a lot of times it is you know, directly proportional with the length of the crop um, lifespan that the productivity is a factor. The third important thing is both at community and household level, there is no capacity to resist and resilient for adaptation. We need actually to see how we can help you know, communities and household level through some kind of safety nets and other things that we are actually now having into agendas as to how we can improve the resilience capacity of these people in order to be able to adapt whatever new ideas and technologies that we are putting in table uh, for climate change. Cindy, so 
you were ignited when we spoke about the, the partial guarantee from government. Could you take that discussion a little further in terms of perhaps what you're looking for in, in financing solutions? Well, thank you very much. I, I think uh, what has been said about the guarantees from governments is correct, but we should also look at what is happening at the regional level. And fortunately, Minister Katete is my chairman <laughs> for the Ministers of Finance and the Health and Trade Insurance Agency, which does provide you know, some uh, guarantees. But you also have the Africa Guarantee uh, 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 facility based in Nairobi that also guarantees the private sector. So we need many of these facilities so that they can also complement uh, what the government uh, is guaranteeing. Now, on the issue of climate change that you mentioned, I just want to say the following very briefly, that uh, because we do not have uh, legacy investments, sunk investments in all technologies, therefore we can leapfrog. And in leapfrogging, thanks, when you leapfrog and the technology is there, all you pay are the licensing fees and other things. I think the challenge we have in terms of leapfrogging uh, to clean uh, technologies, uh, et cetera, is that uh, the way the existing uh, climate funds are structured, uh, we need to, to address them so that uh, they begin uh, to do that. I'll just give you an example. If, for instance, you look at the carbon market for trading, uh, you'll find that uh, the different uh, carbon markets are different. But in Africa, we don't have mature you know, carbon markets. I know that Rwanda has now established a, 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 a market for, for, for trading in, in carbon. So we need to have all these things, but what is important is that uh, we need to get these institutions that are out there, because it's really, for me, uh, unacceptable that all these climate uh, the change facilities, uh, they are based outside, you know, Africa. Uh, they are in Europe, they are in South Korea, they are not in Africa. We need to have them here in Africa because that's where the challenge, you know, is. So I just wanted to say on climate change, we again need to have that uh, innovation in order for us to uh, leapfrog. I'll just give you a final example. If you look at the region, the region has got a lot of emissions from second-hand imported cars, okay? Uh, because those cars cannot, uh, uh, you know, uh, move in the countries where we are importing them. So we also need to deal with the countries that are generating the imports and make sure that uh, they transfer the technology for testing, you know, et cetera, and support us so that we can reduce uh, these uh, emissions. So we, what I'm simply saying is that we need to be uh, practical, uh, pragmatic, and realistic in what we are doing. And, and I think, you, Cindy, so you've, you've picked on a, a very, very valuable point, and this is that technology can help close this gap faster than we participate than we initially thought, because the leapfrogging that you refer to, that's again a term that we use at the World Economic Forum all the time. Technology, innovation can help us close the gap. It can help us get to the level of industrialization of some of those more developed countries. Admasu, let's bring you in here. In terms of the role that technology needs to play as an underpin to the SDGs and making us able to expedite the execution? There's no, there's no question about the importance of technology. I think even in the financial sector, we've seen the M-Pesas, we've seen mobile money completely transform the face of banking as we know it. And I think you've mentioned that renewable energies, we're seeing a whole different economics come through. So it's, it's quite clear that technology has a lot to offer. I think uh, there's a whole matter of adaptability preparedness to adopt the technology, and that's linked to institutional capacity and human capital. And so that goes hand in hand with technology. So it's one thing to see the potential, it's another thing to make it work. So even if you look at leapfrogging technologies that have been around for a full decade, you, you don't see it fully prevalent throughout the continent. There's still many countries that are still trying to actually implement what's been achieved. So it, 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 is, it is out there by way of scope, but I think, again, countries need to take advantage of it and incentivize rapid adoption. 
And Minister Gatesha, perhaps just weigh in in terms of the transformative role that ICT has played within Rwanda and specifically within the East African community. We know that you've wrapped Rwanda in broadband. You also have a situation where among Uganda, Kenya, Rwanda, Tanzania, and South Sudan, there are no longer roaming charges. Now, these are the kind of innovations. When we are looking for solutions that are being executed, we've got to go for the small wins, and then we've got to build on those, those wins and gain momentum. How has it changed life in the East African community? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, before I come to that, if you can allow me, on environment, Really, there are a few things that I, I want to say. Now, there are about eight global funds for environment. And they all each have different requirements for the projects to be financed. What is very important is really how to package these projects. That's number one. And for each country, you are not going to wait for the money from outside. What is very important is to establish a fund. In our case, we have four networks, which is for environment. If people know that there actually there is a fund, then they start innovating into different uh, projects. Thirdly, there has to be a policy that is guiding the whole process. That's why in our case, many people are now investing in the off-grid solutions for energy because there is a clear strategy, there are incentives, and actually we, have, we are now establishing a fund to make sure that we can support that area. So that's very, very important. Now, coming to the IT, I don't know where to start because for us, um, I remember in the year 2000, when we were designing our, our, our vision 2020. Surprisingly, we went through the whole pillars of how we are going, the, the kind of pillars for the development to achieve our vision. And when we finished, the president came up with an idea of saying we needed an IT vision. I can tell you at that time, not many people believed that actually IT would have a big role or would have a big impact. But then he recruited the ECA, a professor from Ghana, and then they said, we need a 20-year plan for the ICT. Even the donors were saying, no, this is not poverty-reducing uh, kind of investment. The first five years, it was sensitizing the Rwandans. The next five years, it was having the infrastructure, the broadband infrastructure, the whole country. And then we started benefiting, bringing in Korea Telecom, bringing in others. And the first beneficiaries were the whole banking system. And I remember I was in the central bank, the way we are doing the banking was totally different. It was completely transformed by the IT. The prices came down, we started the core banking system, and actually instructing all the banks to use the same core banking system that we use in the West. The Delta, FlexTube, the others, all of them. We started now having be able to transfer money very quickly because of the real-time gross settlements and, and the rest of it. And then we started now bringing the cards, and now the phones are now trying to go global. Uh, in the region. And that's why the heads of state in the Northern Corridor for Uganda, Rwanda, and, and Kenya, when they started saying, actually, since we have to trade with each other, and since we say we have to be integrated, yes, we need infrastructure. At the same time, we need the people to move. That's when they removed the passports and the rest of it, and they say ID card would be sufficient. And then this, that's when we, we introduced the inter the East African payment system because of the IT. And that's when they also, the heads of state directed that to remove the roaming charges. The companies, the telecom companies first resisted, and then they saw the benefit. Now they went for it. If I'm in Uganda, if I'm in Kenya, I'm not paying any roaming charges, and I can work as if I'm in Rwanda. This has really boosted the whole business, in addition to the single customs territory where they removed all the non-tariff uh, barriers. So this is very, very important. And that's what really informing us that in Rwanda, when we started with E Ministry X, E Health, E Education, now it is E everything. And we saw, just to give you an example, a few days ago, they were upgrading the energy uh, uh, kind of infrastructure because they were changing the prices. There was an outcry because most people, they buy electricity using their phones. They had to go on the TV to explain. Imagine now if they said you cannot, the telecom companies have a problem and you cannot use your phone to transfer money. You cannot pay for your fertilizers. That would be a catastrophe. If now uh, you have, for example, uh, if, there was a, if there was a failure in the system where you cannot declare your taxes online, that would become a catastrophe. One have forgotten about working with no IT. Now what we are thinking is now the upcoming funding, the innovation fund that is going to help the people to innovate. 
whether it's in transport, in agriculture, in services, in everything because it's the way to go. And the importance of this is, of course, that intra-Africa trade on whatever stat you go to sits somewhere between 12 and 17 percent. Now, in a world where the global order is changing and everybody is talking about deglobalization rather than connectivity, one way for Africa to insulate itself in this scenario is to trade with itself and to kick up that intra-Africa trade, which is why the easing of borders, the free movement of goods, services, and people is so important in being able to mine our own economies and, again, insulate ourselves. But the measuring and the monitoring, now that's also, Dr. Vega Shaw, a big part of the Africa 2030 report. How do you, because if you cannot measure something, you cannot monitor it. And that's part of investing. Investors want to feel that their project timelines are being met, that we're not seeing project overruns, that we're not seeing cost overruns. So talk to me about that portion, and I know, Cindy, so you're going to come in there as well. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I think this is one thing that the SDG board and its second meeting actually um, pinpointing as a major input and a major, you know, um, mission of the center. Because, yes, um, we need to have, uh, you know, a data system. Um, we need to have, actually, a plan. Um, we cannot do, you know, we can't plan without having a proper data system. And then uh, if we uh, don't have the capacity to monitor, um, we cannot actually improve the efficiency of, you know, our performances. And more importantly, if we can't evaluate, we can't learn from, we can't draw any lesson from the past, and we can't actually see the future. So this is extremely important, particularly when it comes to the SDGs. We are part of the globe. We are part of the global program. 193 countries at least signed this accord. And then uh, we have uh, very clear goals and indicators. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we, you know, this planning process is retroactive. And, uh, but as, you know, uh, at the end of the day, we have to have you know, a national level capacity that can actually deal with these data and figures. And also these data and figures have to be standardized, as you know, otherwise we can't actually compare and contrast results between countries and between systems and between sectors, which is a critical information for making, making decisions, including investment decisions. So the whole exercise now is, first, how to set up this system. Second, how actually to create some kind of critical mass around this by bringing together people who are scattered everywhere, having this information, having new knowledge, but never been in one place to you know, kick off this kind of thing. So by that, we will be helping to institutionalize. Third, we have to use the state of the art technology, including real-time data system. A lot of, you know, um, you know, satellite uh, information capacities around us are underutilized, just like any other IT infrastructure. So it will be one thing that we want to bring it into the system, so that we will actually get out of those kind of, you know, faulty, wrong information that actually not only damaging, you know, the performances and efficiencies, but also actually create a lot of problem for the future. So we are heading to that, and uh, we will be helping and working with the countries as to how we can have standardized, if possible, real time, and also, if possible, you know, something that will actually have the entire content of you know, these activities into the same form hub, where we should not only um, you know, do the, the data collection and other things for each sector and each silo, like the past, and be more efficient and more cost effective. So this is what the center is actually discussing this afternoon with uh, uh, representative from the countries. Thank you. SND, sir. Uh, just, to, just to add a footnote very quickly to say that uh, we are really fortunate in this new millennium that uh, we have the e-solutions. And I met with the Minister for ICTs over there, you will agree with me. Because once you have the e-solutions, even when we talk about financial inclusion, and you have uh, mobile payments and transactions, it is now easy to capture the data. 
Because when you use the manual systems, it is difficult. The same applies to health. The same will apply to education, etc. This is why I say uh, what we need to do is really to leapfrog. Uh, and I can see the leapfrogging uh, in this region in terms of mobile payments, etc. In this region, particularly in Kenya, other countries, it's more than in the advanced you know, countries. So we can apply it across you know, the, the board. Now, regarding the data that we are also talking about, um, if you look at the African Development Bank, they're also having a project on data, the World Bank, a project on data. We are also running a project on data. We have a massive database on trade. We run consumer price surveys, which we publish monthly for 16 of my member countries. Uh, the question is not only the data, but who then uses you know, that data. These are the things that we have got to address. But with the uh, automation, the digitization of our economies, uh, it will be uh, easy um, for us to begin to measure uh, uh, what we are doing, to be able to monitor and evaluate. For me, I think ICT is key. Obviously, we've got to get people to design the databases and other things. I thank you. So we've got five minutes. I just want to go to concluding comments um, from the panel and go back to where we started the discussion. In terms of the, the low-hanging fruit, number one, policy certainty has to be given as a priority because that is the only way we are going to attract the financing that we need to close the deficits that we've got across the board. So policy certainty followed by financing and innovative financing solutions, partial guarantees we've spoken about, and then this underpin of technology, being able to innovate, being able to leapfrog, and to disperse technologies to help the broader population achieve inclusive growth. I'm gonna throw it to you, Admasu, to start. I'm gonna come back this way, finalize with Minister Gatete. Build on this statement. If you don't agree with me, Throw it out and give me another priority. But don't forget the climate change and don't forget the population growth because we've got time bombs on both of those elements. So you tell me whether we're coming to the right conclusion because from here, it's about execution. And the role that a media house like CNBC Africa will play in this, and we've done it quite adequately on the World Economic Forum stage, is that we are gonna be here to monitor and measure and report every step of the way as we move through the SDG execution. Admasu. Well, maybe I'll just say that charity begins at home. So when you talk about policy stability, policy suitability, I think we need to demonstrate that in the context of domestic resource mobilization. I think capital markets, good financial sector governance, these are all things that will allow Africa to take advantage of the resources it already has within its space including financial resources that reside outside of the continent. We have at least 400 billion US dollars of reserves sitting overseas, and pension funds and insurance companies also have a lot of capital. Question is, what are we doing to take advantage of the money that we own? Because if we can demonstrate it with our own capital, then you have a much better chance of attracting foreign capital. So I think it's, it's not just about policy, it's also about behavior. We've been talking some of these things for a long time, but they don't actually happen, right? So I think there's really a question of credibility and leadership that's required to actually execute some of these things that are actually quite apparent. We know many of these things already. So for me, the test really is about uh, uh, monitoring evaluation, putting up a mirror to our, to, our, to our communities to see who's actually been delivering on what's been said. So it comes back to the monitoring, the measuring, the delivery, the leadership, Sandisa. No, I don't want. No, I don't know what you want me to say because I find that my colleague at Masu is talking generally. What he should have said is what uh, his own bank has been able to get these reserves to be used within the region. They have been able to deal with the market failure. Just to give you an example, where they would get a central bank putting 100 million dollars in the bank, and they multiplied four times for trade financing, but they also you know, lend money to the same country to the tune of 300 million. And in no time, they build up the reserves from less than one month to, to three months within eight months. You know, they've, they've done it. 
So he should have simply said that this is being done. That's the innovation which I was talking about. They are doing that. There are so many innovations that we are having in Africa. I think what we need to do is to begin to take these best practices, uh, you know, upscale them, uh, so that we stop talking about uh, the problems of illicit financial flows, etc. because it is within our means to be able to get this money back into the continent. I thank you. So a scale best practice, we're adding as we build through the panel. Dr. Begashaw. Um, I think in conclusion, <clears throat> uh, what I want to say is pursuing SDGs is uh, maybe the most defining challenge for Africa in the 21st century. Um, it's true, this is, this is not going to happen in, uh, as business as usual. We have to do things differently and uh, we have to also have to have a sense of urgency um, because in a lot of ways, uh, many of these problems should have been resolved yesterday, um, but we are still with it. But keeping them for tomorrow is actually as, as uh, bad as crime. So we got to react, we got to do what we can do, and we have to do things in a very not innovative way. And when it comes to issues like you know, information technology, I think as much as we are advocating about the importance and importance of investing and importance of um, you know, uh, IETs for efficiency and for cost effectiveness and all these things, I'm also worried about how we can optimize this already invested resource. There are a lot of resources on this um, from you know, countries. So we got to see how actually we have to have one more matrix on the efficiency of this technology by putting social impact as the most important uh, matrix. Um, of course, the two most standing issues, climate change and population, are still very, very important. Um, we are not expecting all countries to adopt all SDG goals, because some of them are global, some of them are not even in the context. But every country is expected to do something on these two major issues, particularly in Africa. If we don't do that, we will lose all our gains. Not only that, um, we, it, in, some, in, some, in some extent, our vulnerability is to the extent that we can be extinct. Thank you. Minister Gatete, somber words coming from Dr. Begashaw there. Uh, thank you very much. Maybe if I can go back to say, why are we doing this? Is we want to make sure that we really address the issues of growth, which brings in uh, really the resources that we need. We need to address the issues of poverty, we need to address the issues of inequality so that the growth is, becomes more inclusive, does not leave anyone behind. But there are some things which are really very constant, which really give assurance for any investment. And I just want to say, if you don't have macroeconomic stability, if you, have, you don't have high growth, inflation is very high, if you don't take care of the, uh, the situation of debt and the financial stability, then someone is going to say, there is a problem. If there is no business conducive environment, then there is a problem. If there is no good governance, then there is a problem. But also what is very important is that you can no longer, at this time and age, think local, think domestic. There has to be integration. Those are very, very important. But at the second time, I mean, uh, on, on the other issue, we need innovation. And innovation cuts across. You need innovation in financing. You need innovation in project structuring. You need innovation almost in everything. So innovation becomes very critical. At the same time, you don't just pick any project. You also need high-impact projects. And I want to just give you two examples. In Rwanda, you have innovated many ways. But there's one project that was initiated by our head of state, the One Cow Per Poor Family Project. And this one had multiple impact because it's targeting the poor. You know it's going to bring in income for the poor families. It's going to address the issue of malnutrition. It's going to, uh, to provide fertilizers. And in our own case, given our history, the first produce is given to your neighbor. And in one, if you give someone a cow, it means something else. It means permanent friendship. And that way it's addressing the issue uh, of the past, in our, in our case, because of the unity that we need very badly. So that project has multiple impact. Another project that I would say is that we've been innovating, banks, government, this and that, but the project on Rwanda Online, 
is providing the services to ordinary people, all of them, that for any basic services, you can get it online without traveling, without going to face, line up, and be able to wait for days or months. But by doing it online, then you are saving a lot of money for a big population of people. So I'm talking about the big impact projects. In, terms, in, as, in as much as we are doing innovation, the high impact projects becomes very critical. So I think as we do this, we can learn from each other. We can learn from the best practices, and it is very, very important that we work among each other to see what works in one country that can be replicated, or what is innovated in one country that will, could have multiple impact in another country. So I think here it's a learning exercise. Nobody can claim you have all the answers, and each country is unique. The starting point is different. The issues of each country are different, and cooperation, that's where it becomes very, very important. And just to pick up on those words, as you say, no one can claim to have all the answers. It's going to take a lot of jostling, a lot of different models to get the right formula, specifically when you're dealing with 54 different countries across the African continent. Although, I must say, the conversation is certainly becoming more regional, gentlemen. We're now talking about East Africa, West Africa, and Southern Africa. So let's go back to where we started, that the path, the business as usual path, needs to change. And as you deep dive into the afternoon sessions, take that one element out. It's about speed of execution. And Minister, we've ended many, many panels on execution, execution, execution. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.